to time it, Chuck. Good job. All right, you can open your Bibles and turn them to 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. And the plan today, if the Lord permits, uh, is to make it all the way to chapter 22, verse 40. Uh, We'll see if that happens. But it's it's kind of a, a interesting uh, sideways, a- almost a, a kind of a I don't know a, an aside to where the story has been. We've been focusing on on the life of Elijah, um, and so the, so the Lord has spoken to Elijah through Elijah. Judgment has come upon uh, upon Israel. Um, and, we, and we looked at the life of Elijah, and we looked at um, God restoring Elijah and comforting him, uh, and, we, and, we, and we saw that, that God's judgment was going to be coming upon Israel and upon uh, Ahab uh, through, through, through Elisha, who would be the next prophet, um, through uh, the Syrians, uh, as well as through uh, the next king, or one of the next kings of Israel, Jehu. Uh, and so, so God's judgment is quickly approaching Israel. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of transitions, and we get a glimpse uh, at, at really Ahab's life uh, and, and what goes on. And, and what we're going to see uh, this evening is, is if, you know, if I were to give this a title, I would call it the three sins of Ahab. Not that he just committed three sins, but there's, there's three uh, sins of, uh, that, that, the, that the author is emphasizing uh, through through the kind of three different stories of Ahab. And, and, and in these three sins, each time God sends three kind of prophets who give a, 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 a warning to Ahab. Uh, and each time it gives Ahab an opportunity uh, to repent and to turn. In fact, one time we'll see that, that, that Ahab does repent, or at least he goes through the motions of, of repentance. Um, but at, at, at the end, uh, the, the word of the Lord really catches up with Ahab, and, and we'll see that Ahab, uh, his life, um, the judgment of the Lord, finds him. And so uh, there's three sins of Ahab, uh, and, and we're going to try to, as we go, we'll, we'll try, to, try to spot them. And so, uh, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read every little thing uh, this, this, this evening like, like I usually do. We're gonna, I'm going to summarize some things because I want us to kind of see a, a larger picture and a larger overall theme uh, that I believe we can uh, we can uh, see here. So, um, in in twenty verses one through twelve, we we have a description of of Syria coming to Israel, Syria invading, and they have come all the way up to Samaria, and they've kind of cast this the uh, the siege. It says it says in verse one that 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 he went up. This Ben Ben Hadad, who's the king of Syria, went up and closed in on Samaria and fought against it. Uh, and so he's he's winning. He's 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 pushing back uh, Ahab all the way into the capital city, and then he sends messengers into the city to Ahab and basically said tells Ahab in verse three, your silver and your gold are mine. Your best wives and children are also mine. So give me these things, and, and, and you, can, you can live. And in verse 4, it says, The king of Israel answered, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. So no problem. You take those things. You take the gold and the silver. You take the women and children, and, and, and let me be, and everything's good. Well, when Ben-Hadad hears this, he's like, Well, if that's the case, well, maybe I should have asked for more. And so he sends messengers back into Samaria. Uh, And it says in verse 5, he says, I sent to you saying, deliver to me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children. Nevertheless, verse 6, I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your house and the houses of your servants and lay hands on whatever pleases you and take it away. So this time he kind of ups the ante. He says, all right, we're not just going to take some gold and silver and your women and your children. Anything in your house that pleases you, we're going to take. We're going to take it from you. Well, for Ahab, this, there's a line, and they crossed that line. Uh, and he says, he says, you won't. And basically, there's some trash talking that goes back and forth between these kings. 
uh, and, and, and battle or war is inevitable. So we come to verse 13. Uh, the, 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 the previously, the, or in verse 12, they're taking up positions. This battle's about to happen. And in verse 13, it says, And behold, a prophet came near. Now that phrase this is going to be repeated uh, three times in this chap- chapter. A prophet who is a representative of the word of the Lord. So the word is coming near to Ahab. Now, up until now, whenever the prophet came near to Ahab, it was always negative. It's always negative. Like, uh, you know, Ahab's got an issue with these prophets because every time he talks to them, it's, it's always doom and woe. Uh, but this time, a prophet comes near with, with good news. It says, thus says the Lord, have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will give it into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So, for the first time in his reign, he gets good news from a prophet. Every, all these multitude that have surrounded your city is going to be, I'm going to give it into your hand, and you're going to know that I'm the Lord. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, in verse 15, then he mustered the servants of the governors of the districts, and they were 232. And after them, he mustered all the people of Israel, 7,000. So, so there's 7,000 people. Maybe that sounds like a lot. Uh, but when you look at some of the numbers that we'll see, the, the Syrians had, had, had a much, much grander army, much larger army, probably hundreds of thousands. In verse 16, look what happens. And they went out at noon while Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk at the booths. He and 32 kings who helped him. So he had 32 kings in an alliance. So, so a huge, huge display, a huge army. And, and they're all having a party, probably excited about the victory that's going to be theirs because they know, numbers-wise, they're going to squash them. Like, this is, this is going to be a no-contest fight. Uh, and yet, they get word that men are coming out from Samaria in verse 17. In verse 18, he said, if they have come out for peace, take them alive. Or if they have come out for war, take them alive. Uh, a lot of people think that this has been Hadad showing that he is drunk because that really makes no sense. And that's very hard for an army to accomplish uh, when the command is take them alive. Right? Here's guys that are coming out to kill you. Make sure you take them alive. So, so people think that maybe Ben Hadad was, was, not, was not thinking clearly in his command. But nevertheless, that's what he said. Verse 19, so these went out of the city, the servants of the governors of the districts, and the army that followed them, and each struck down his man. The Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. But Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, escaped on a horse with horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and struck the horses and chariots and struck the the Syrians with a great blow. So clear victory. Israel has has won. Verse 22, then the prophet came near, here we go again, to the king of Israel and said to him, come, strengthen yourself and consider well what you have to do, for in the spring the king of Syria will come up against you. All right, so, so in other words, he's saying, go strengthen yourself, but in the spring it's going to happen again. And so now we transition to the, to the Syrians. Well, what's going on in there? And the servants of the king of Syria, verse 23, said to him, their gods are gods of the hills. And so they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. And do this. Remove the kings, each from his post, and put commanders in their places, and muster an army like the army that you have lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. Then we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he listened to their voice and did so. Uh, so you have two things going on here. You have some military strategy. If, if you're a larger army, it's much better to be fighting in the plains than it is in the mountains, so there's some good strategy going on, but then there's also some very poor theology, because they are attributing the gods of Israel with the gods of Baal, which are gods of the hills, right? That's where they, that's where they, that's where they build their altars. That's where they build uh, their, their, their idolatrous temples, and so they just assume, well, they, they worship those gods, which Israel did, but they're not fighting those gods. They're fighting Yahweh, and Yahweh is not just God of the hills. He's God of the hills. He's God of the valleys. He's God of everything, and so, so at their core, the problem that they have uh, is not a poor military strategy. That's pretty good. They have a poor theology. They have a poor understanding of the God in whom uh, uh, they think Israel worships. And so, um, verse 26, in the spring, Ben-Hadad 
mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the people of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went against them. The people of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of goats. All right, so, so just a two little meager army, nothing, nothing uh, that impressive. But the Syrians filled the country. Verse 28, here we go again. And a man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude in your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Once again, good news comes to Ahab. And if we, I mean, just think about God's grace that's coming to Ahab. Like this is, Ahab has not earned this. Ahab has, has what, what he should be receiving right now is complete judgment. Right? He has led the people of Israel to worship false gods, and yet here, to protect his own name, Yahweh comes and, 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 and is gracious to Ahab and is promising victory. And sure enough, verse 29, and they encamped opposite one another seven days. Then on the seventh day, the battle was joined, and the people of Israel struck down of the Syrians 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. And listen to this. And the rest fled into the city of Aphek, and the wall fell upon 27,000 men who were left. Now, what does that sound like right there? Jericho. Sounds like Jericho, right? In fact, in fact listen, in, in uh, verse 29, it says, and they, and they encamped opposite one another for seven days. So here's, here's the army of the Lord. Here's the army of the S- S- Syrians. And they're just kind of staring at each other for seven days. Right? You think of the battle of Jericho. What happens? Israel, they marched around for seven days. They didn't do anything. Right? They're just marching around. Uh, then, they, then they have this, you know, they just obliterate 100,000, and, and those, the, the remaining flee into the city where they think it's safety, and the wall just comes tumbling down on them and kills 27,000. Right? <clears throat> now, if we put some, 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 some things together, uh, we might be able to anticipate what's going to come next, and where and how Ahab is going to sin. Because uh, already, if we go back a couple chapters uh, to chapter 18, verse 18, there's this dialogue between Elijah and Ahab, and, and, and a- a- Elijah has called to meet with Ahab, and Ahab comes to Elijah and he says, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah's response to that, he says, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house. So does anybody remember where that, that troubler of Israel is spoken of again? Spoken of in, in Joshua 7, so after Jericho, and it's, and it's in reference to Achan. Achan, who keeps some of the devoted things to the Lord, Right? He keeps some of that for himself. He hides him and brings judgment upon Israel. And eventually judgment comes upon his house. And, and, and Joshua calls him, you're a troubler of Israel. You've caused us to, to lose at Ai. Right? So that's what comes after. So if we think about that and we think that, okay, here's this battle of Jericho, then maybe we can anticipate what might happen next. Look at verse 31. <clears throat> so, so, so this is the servants of Ben-Hadad. Or, or, or 30, the end of verse 30. Ben-Hadad also fled and entered an inner chamber in the city. And his servant said to him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us put sackcloth around our waist and ropes and on our heads and get out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So they tied sackcloth around their waist and put ropes on their heads and went to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. And he said, Does he still live? He is my brother. Now, that's not true, right? Ben-Hadad is a Syrian. He's a, he's, a, he's a worshiper of a false god. He's not the brother of Ahab. Verse 33, now the men were watching for a sign, and they quickly took it up from him and said, yes, your brother Ben-Hadad. So, so they're looking to, to see if Ahab is going to be merciful. And when, and when, and when Ahab describes Ben-Hadad, he's, he's like my brother. They're like, okay, we're, we're good, all right? They quickly took it up from him and said, yes, your brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, go and bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came out to him, and he, that's Ahab, caused him to come up into the chariot. So Ben-Hadad comes out, and Ahab brings him up to him, to bring him up into the chariot, puts him on, a, on an equal level with him, and they, and they make a treaty. They make a covenant with each other in verse 34. And Ben-Hadad said to him, the cities that my father took from your father, I will restore. 
And you may establish bazaars for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. And they have said, I will let you go on these terms. So he made a covenant with him and let him go. Now, some people are like, well, man, what a, what a great guy Ahab is, right? Man, he, he you know, it's, it's just him. It, it, it's just like Jesus, right? He's being merciful to the foreigner. Well, this isn't, this isn't just a foreigner. This is a, this is a hater of God. This is someone who wants to annihilate God's people. So let's look what happens. Verse 35. I'm going to read all the way to verse 43. And a certain man of the sons of the prophet said to his fellow at the command of the Lord, Strike me, please. But the man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, Because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as you have gone for me, a lion shall strike you down. And as soon as he had departed from him, a lion met him and struck him down. Then he found another man and said, strike me, please. And the man struck him and struck him and wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way, disguising himself with a bandage over his eyes. And as the king passed, he cried to the king and said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle and behold, a soldier turned and brought a man to me and said, guard this man. If by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. And as your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. The king of Israel said to him, so shall your judgment be, you yourself have decided. Now let me just stop right there, because it's really strange, right? So, so here, here's, here's, here's a prophet, here's another man of God, and he asked somebody who's with him, hey, strike me. Like, like this is what the Lord wants to happen. And the guy's like, uh-uh, I ain't striking you. Well, he refused to listen to the word of the Lord, so judgment comes upon him. This is very similar to what we saw back in 1 Kings 13, where, where, where a, a man of God didn't heed the word of the Lord that was told him, and he, and he turned away, and he went into the house, and what happened? He was eaten by a lion, right? So, so, so you know, we can, we can get in a tizzy about that. Like, man, that's, that's, that sure is awfully rough. Well, it's, man, when the word of the Lord speaks, you listen, right? You listen. Uh, and so he gets another guy. Uh, and, and he says, strike him. And this guy strikes him. And so he's got a wound, and he, and, he, and, he, and he bandages himself, and he disguises himself of Ahab. And he comes to Ahab, and he says, look, um, I, I was in the war, and I was wounded. And so I was, I, was, I was basically just said, hey, just watch this prisoner of war. Keep your eyes on him. Don't let him go, because if you let him go, then it's basically a life for life. Or, or you've got just this insurmountable debt that you cannot pay. And he says, well, I got busy doing this or that, and he escaped. So, so, so what, what should I do? And Ahab's like, well, you said your judgment. That's what you deserve. Now look what happens. Verse 41. Then he hurried to take the bandage away from his eyes, and the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. And he, the prophet, said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have let go out of your hand the man whom I had devoted to destruction, uh, or, or, or devoted as an offering to the Lord. Therefore, your life shall be for his life and your people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house, vexed and sullen, and came to Samaria. So, so what you see here is that is the, the prophet is depicting what Ahab has done. Ahab had a command from the Lord, had a promise from the Lord to, 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 to destroy the Syrians. And, and even though it's, it's not explicitly in the text, it seems that, that there's this, this, this kind of holy war, this, this uh, we need to wipe these people out. We, we can't let one man survive because if we do, they're going to turn our hearts away from the Lord. They need to be devoted to destruction. This is, this is the Lord's war. This isn't, this isn't man's war. This isn't, this isn't Israel getting up there and flexing their mighty men and doing these incredible things. This is the Lord going before them and saying, these people are mine and I'm going to give you the victory, and you need to devote all of them to destruction. And Ahab doesn't. Ahab saves the king. And he doesn't just save the king. He makes a covenant with the king, and he lets him go. Just like the prophet let go the prisoner of war. And so this is a, this is a, you know, this is a, a, a David and Nathan moment, right? Where David takes something that, that doesn't, doesn't belong to him, Right? And, 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 and he, then he, he, he murders the guy, and the prophet confronts him, and he gives him this story. And David's like, man, that guy deserves to die. And David's like, you are the man, right? Uh, that's exactly what this prophet does. You are the guy. You're the one who let this guy go. Now, the result of David, when he was confronted by the prophet of the Lord, was repentance. Ahab is not repentant. He's vexed and sullen. He's upset. He can't believe 
that this prophet has, has told him these things. And so, so what we see in Ahab's first sin is this. He makes peace with a hater of God. He makes peace. There's, there's an unholy union that's going on here that shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening. All right? and, and this is not... This is not the idea of, oh, you know, any, it doesn't apply to us in the sense that, okay, now anyone who's, who's not of the Lord, we need to go and just, we need to, we need to wipe out, right? That's, 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 not, that's not what's going on here. It's more of the idea that anything that's in our life that is causing us to turn our hearts away to the Lord, we kill, right? You think of the language of Jesus, if, if you've got a hand that causes you to sin, cut it off, Right? That, that's more, it's more of a, for us, it's more of a spiritual application. If, if there's something in our life, and maybe it is a, a group of people that's causing to, to turn your heart from the Lord, then, then you don't have anything to do with them. You, you cut them out of, of your life. Ahab is not doing this. And so we have this first warning of the prophet uh, in, in verse 42. Your life shall be for his life and your people for his people. And so Ahab's first sin, this unholy union, he makes peace with a hater of God. Now, chapter 21 kind of a, a shifts to a completely different story. <clears throat> and it's a very interesting story. And I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with this. This is a, uh, maybe the, your subtitle says uh, Naboth's Vineyard. Uh, so we have this man, Naboth, who's the Jezreelite, and he has a vineyard. And this vineyard is, is a gorgeous vineyard, and it's right by the king's palace. And the king's in his palace, and he looks at it, he sees it, he loves it, and he wants it. And he wants to, he wants to take the vineyard. Now, no, notice what he wants to do with this in verse, in verse 2. And after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it, it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value and money. Now, here's what's interesting. So he has this vineyard. And he wants to take the vineyard and he wants to turn it into a vegetable garden. Now, that word vegetable garden is only used one other time in the entire Old Testament. And it's in Deuteronomy 11.10. Let me read this real quick. Deuteronomy 11, verse 10. Here's what it says. For the land that you are entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. So in Deuteronomy 11.10, a garden of vegetables is equated with Egypt. So here, Ahab wants to take this vineyard and he wants to turn it into a garden of vegetables. And so he wants to, he wants to turn Israel light into Egypt. That's, that's, the, that's the symbolism that, 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 that's, going, that's going on here. Because throughout Scripture, the vineyard is always associated with Israel. It's always associated with Israel. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, 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 symbolism or, or it's, it's an illustration of what's going on in Israel and what Ahab is wanting to do with Israel. Now look at verse 3. But Naboth, Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Like, this isn't even really mine to give. It's, it's my family's. It belongs to my family, and it's going to stay in my family to provide for my family. And so he's, he's being a, a faithful man. He could have, he could have had a much grand, better place. He could, have a, he could have had a lot more money from Ahab, but he says, no. No, 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 no. He, Naboth is, is shown to be a faithful man. So Ahab is ticked off. Again, he's, he says he, he's vexed and he's, he's sullen. Uh, and so, so here, here's what's interesting. He, Ahab makes a, a covenant with a, with a hater of God. And he's upset when he gets addressed about it. He's vexed and sullen. And, and, but, but he makes this covenant and, he, and he, he has this, he calls Ben-Hadad his brother. But this man who is actually his brother, he hates him. He despises him. All right, so you can, you can see, you can see the, the, the heart of Ahab coming out. And so he goes, and you know the story. He tells Jezebel, and Jezebel's like, well, you're the king. Do what you want. Uh, I'll get this garden for you. And so she writes letters. Um, verse, uh, verse 8, she wrote letters, and she, she sends them to, uh, to, to the, the town of uh, Jezreel and, and, and to, to the elders there. And, and basically, she, she, she writes the scenario to have Naboth killed. She's going to have two, uh, it's called in my Bible, two worthless men who come and lie about Naboth and say he's cursed God and the king, and they're going to take him out, and they're going to stone him. 
That's exactly uh, what happens. Uh, verse 13, and the two worthless men came in and sat opposite him, and the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king, so they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned, he is dead. And so it says in verse 15 that Ahab, Jezebel tells Ahab, arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, which he refused to give you for the money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And Ahab, it says in verse 6, that he took possession of it. Um, again, there's language there that's kind of a, a reversal of Joshua. Joshua uh, is commanded by the Lord, take possession of the land. Uh, it, it's yours. Here, it's an opposite. It's a reversal. Ahab is identified with Egypt, and now he's, 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 he's reversing what has taken place. He's taking possession of it uh, for himself and for his gods to establish Baal worship in, in the land. Um, and so, so what, would we, what would we say is Ahab's second sin here? His first sin is he makes an unholy alliance. But here he, he kills a faithful brother, right? He kills an Israelite just to have his, just to have his, have his land. Um, and so uh, obviously the Lord is not going to happen. So now the Lord calls Elijah in verse 17. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And so basically he just casts judgment upon it. He says uh, uh, at the end of verse 19, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood says in verse 21, Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. So this is, again, a warning to Ahab. This is what's going to happen to you. And, and, and he gives a warning to, to Jezebel, a judgment upon Jezebel. The dogs shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. So Ahab hears this. And in verses 25 through 29, he goes through the motions of repentance. Look what it says in verse 27. And when Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. And it says, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has um humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the disaster upon his house. And so he... he, he, he seems to prostrate himself before the Lord. It's very similar to what uh, the king of Nineveh does in, in Jonah. When Jonah goes and preaches to repent, and the king does the same thing. He puts sackcloth and ashes, and, 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 and he's, he's, he's wailing out dejectedly. And so he seems to have a, a true heart of repentance, and the Lord responds. He's merciful to him. Um, he says, I, I'm not going to destroy the house of Israel in your lifetime, but it's going to come in your son's life. It's just a, it's just a prolonged judgment. So... Uh, what do we think of what do we think of this this chapter here? Like this is this is you know we're going through this storyline, all this stuff, and then all of a sudden we have this this kind of random story about Ahab taking this this garden. All right, um, think about Ahab. Here, here's a here's here's a quote about that I want to read. <clears throat> that helps kind of connect what maybe some of the things that are going on here. Ahab, Ahab is a David, seizing what is dear to his neighbor and arranging for his neighbor's death. With, with Jezebel, he is a Cain, attacking a brother in Israel. Incited by Jezebel, he's an Adam who takes forbidden fruit of another's vineyard. So you can see the, the, these connections. He's doing all these things. He is, he is, a, he is a picture of, of, of someone who's, who's living in rebellion, who's completely disregarding the word of the Lord, who's turning people away, who is, who is uh, taking things that don't belong who, to him. Uh, that's who Ahab is. Now, now, now think about this, the overall story. Listen to this. Uh, this story is an allegory. The vineyard is Israel, 
and idolatrous Ahab seeking to turn the vineyard of Israel back to Egypt. Naboth, Naboth re represents the faithful within Israel holding on to the promise to Abraham and the inheritance given by Yahweh. So, 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 so Naboth is like, no, this is, this is not good. We need, to, we need, to, we need to, 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 to claim and possess the inheritance of, my, of the fathers, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. We need to remain faithful, faithful to them. That's what, that's what Naboth represents. And Ahab is like, no, he wants to take it and he wants to turn it back in. He wants to turn it back in into Egypt. Um, and then, then, and this is really, uh, you know, it's the same. This, there's a lot of correlation between this story here, and you, when you think of Jesus' parable in, in Mark 12, uh, where, where he talks about, where he equates, uh, or tells, tells the, the religious leaders, he's like, uh, the, here, here's a vineyard, and, and a man, the, the owner of the vineyard, vineyard leaves, and he, he leaves it with his tenants, right? And the tenants are, 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 are called to, uh, uh, to, to keep it for him and, and to give back to uh, uh, to the owner. Well, they begin, they don't do that, right? And so the owner sends these, these, these men to come, these prophets, uh, these people to come, hey, this, this is what you want. What do they do? They kill the prophets. And eventually Jesus is saying, it, 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 now I'm the son and I'm come and, and, and you're, going, you're going to kill me. So, so th that's exactly what is going on. Here's, here's Ahab, who's supposed to be a, a tenant, who's supposed to be uh, lead He's supposed to be a leader of the worship of God, and he's not doing it. And the prophets are coming to him and toiling him to repent, warning him of what's going to happen. The judgment will come, and he refuses to listen. And here he kills this faithful servant. I think about Naboth, right? Here's Naboth, a faithful man. And what happens to Naboth? Well, you, he's, he's, he's put before a, a false trial, right? He's lied about. And he's taken outside of the city, right, which it's, it's interesting that it, that it gives the location because that's where, uh, that's where the, the, the purification offering would, would be taken out for, for sins. He's taken out and he's stoned to death. He's killed, right? Na Naboth is, a, is, 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 is representing Jesus here. He's, he's the faithful servant who comes and he's, 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 he's given a, a, false, a false trial. He's lied about. He's taken outside of the city and he's killed. He's the, he's, he's the brother of Israel uh, who was who killed. Um, let's quickly go through uh, into, into chapter 22. Uh, another very fascinating passage. 22 it says, For three years Syria and Israel uh, continued without war. So there, there's peace among these people. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. Now Jehoshaphat, an interesting name. Uh, the name means Yahweh judges. That's his name. And Jehoshaphat, the name is used 13 times in verses 1 through 40. And Ahab, his name is never used. He's just the king of Israel. So, Jeho so, so there's, there's clearly something. He, he gives, it's, it's Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and then it's just the king of Israel. And, and what, what we're wanting to see is, is, is this is, this is, this, this chapter is about God judging Ahab. The, the judgment is going to come down upon Ahab, and you can see that in the repetition of the name of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is a faithful king of Judah. We haven't really been introduced to him. All we've seen are the Israelite kings. But now this, 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 this kind of random king of Judah all of a sudden comes in whose name means Yahweh judges. So it says in verse 4, And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And so he's saying, okay, we're, we're of the same, same people. And, and Jehoshaphat actually, we'll, we'll find out uh, uh, in, a, in a few weeks that uh, he gets judged for that. He gets judged for, for entering into a treaty here. But overall, Jehoshaphat is a, is, is a good king. He's identified mostly as a good king. He should not have uh, made an alliance with, with Ahab, uh, but he does. And he says in verse 5, And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Inquire first of the word of the Lord. All right, so you, you can see, he's like, oh, we're, not going out, we're not going into battle. We're not going to do this unless, unless the Lord is in it, unless the Lord wants us to do it. Now look at verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, 
and said to them, Shall I go into battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Now, where have we heard 400 prophets before? Elijah, right? It's, it's 450, so, but, but, but it, uh, you know, 450 prophets of Baal, 400, and now we have these 400 prophets. Now, what's the difference between the prophets of Baal and these guys? Ultimately, you're, you're saying, hey, there's, there's nothing different. Ultimately, there's, there's nothing different. But, but what's, what's different about their approach? The prophets of Baal were, were, were you know, they were cutting themselves they were clearly worshiping another god. These guys, what, is it, what are the descriptions about these guys? These guys at least give the appearance of speaking on behalf of Yahweh. They're not, they're not, they're not saying we, we, we represent Baal. They're saying we represent Yahweh. Uh, and so what you see here is that, is that the enemy has, has kind of shifted tactics. Before, he used 450 prophets of Baal, and they're just outspoken pagan worshipers, cutting themselves, doing everything they can in worship of Baal. This time, the enemy approaches, and he approaches like he's a, like he's a sheep. He approaches uh, dressed up like he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. I think it's very interesting, right? Uh, because because what, what, what we see in our culture is not so much, I mean, well, we, we do see it some, but as far as in the religious Christian scene, uh, you, see, you, you see these guys. You see guys that look uh, like they're like they're like they're 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 prophets of the Lord, like they're speaking. But what they're saying is not what the Lord has declared. They're like the Pharisees. They're like, the they're, they're like you know, I'll put it out there. They're like prosperity teachers. They're like they're like these guys that, that, that they, they 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 got all the they got the nice suit. They got the nice smiles. They got some of the right lingo. At least it sound it sounds good. It sounds encouraging. Man, I, I really like that. That sounds great. He's saying, man, you just keep on. You just keep going. Don't worry about sin. You're just, everything's good. That's what these guys are, go- that's what these guys are saying here. They're like, ah, oh, take it. You're good, king. Yep, yep, the Lord is in it. He's in it. Take it. Claim it, right? That's saying what he wanted to see. Exactly. Now look what happens, verse 7. Jehoshaphat, again, this is where you see Jehoshaphat. He, 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 he's for Yahweh. He said, is there, not, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? Uh, now, I don't know if, like, these, if there's some sort of marking on these guys, how Jehoshaphat knows, but, but I think it's like, like, hey, when there's 400 guys and all they're saying is, oh, yeah, just keep going, just, just keep doing it, he's like, ah, there's something not right with this. Is there somebody else? And so look, at, well, look what happens in verse 8. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, but I hate him, <laughs> for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. Right? So, so these guys tell what the king, just like you said, Frank, these guys tell what the king wants to hear. This guy, he actually says the word of the Lord, and it's always negative. Uh, uh, and Jehoshaphat said, let not, let, let not the king say so. Well, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it'll, it'll be different. Verse 9, then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, at the threshing floor, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. Now there's, you know, whenever there's these kind of these details, you, know, you want to kind of take note. Uh, the threshing floor and the gate are, are two places that we see uh, judgment take place. The threshing floor is where you divide the wheat from the tares, Right, so so that we know we've got imagery of that, and, and, and the gate would be where the place, like the opening of the city, that's that's where that's where judgments come down. That's where the people gather to, to judgment. So so there seems to be like the, the author wants to see this as as, the, as as a place of judgment. Okay, verse eleven. And Zedekiah the son of Kananas uh, made for himself horns of iron and said, "Thus says the Lord: With these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed." All right, this, you're good, King. You're going to push them back. And, the, and all the prophets said, said the same thing. Verse 13. And the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. So he's saying, hey, you need a prophecy like these guys. Just, just get in line, Micaiah. And I love Micaiah's response. He said, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. I, I'd love for that to be a, just a, a motto of my life. What the Lord says, that's what I'm going to speak. That's what I'm going to speak. I don't care 
if it's step on toes, I don't care. If all these other people are saying these other things, what the Lord says, that's what I'm going to declare with my life. Um, then verse 15, and when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Now, this is interesting because Micaiah gives a favorable prophecy. But what's interesting is that the prophecy is ambiguous, right? We, we've, got, we've got three kings involved in this story. We have the king of the Assyrians, or the king of the Syrians, we have King Ahab, and we have King Jehoshaphat. And all he says is, Go up and triumph, the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Well, who king? Which king? What king? So, so, so we're not really, and even, even back in, uh, it's the same thing in verse, in verse uh, 6, right? Because uh, these pro- some of these prophets are under, the, under the, the notion that they actually are prophets of the Lord, and we'll see that here in a moment. But they say at the end of verse 6, go up for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. Again, it's an ambiguous statement. It's, we don't know exactly. It doesn't say the king of Israel. It just says he's going to give it into the hand of the king, verse 16. But the king said to him, so King Ahab, how many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Now we get a little more in depth in Micaiah's prophecy. It says, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. So he sees this, this, this the, he, he, he receives a vision of Israel scattered on the mountains. They're, they're, they're just scattered everywhere. Uh, it says, verse 18, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? M- Micaiah continues, verse 19, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. The Lord said to him, by what means? He said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. Now, this is a rather difficult text. Because because this is implying that the Lord at times puts a deceiving spirit into people. Right? Like, 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 you know, so, so. So what do we make of this? Well, he puts a deceiving spirit, yes, but what's interesting is that he sends a deceiving spirit upon these prophets, and then he tells Micaiah, and Micaiah tells Ahab that he sent a deceiving spirit. And so it's almost like, okay, we're going to do this, and, and, and Ahab is going to go with these prophets, and he's going and he's, and he, he's to end up getting killed, but we're also going to warn him. But he sends another prophet to saying these guys are lying. Um, now, you know, there, there's, been, there's been books and books written on, on you know, is, does, 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 God, does God deceive? Does God lie? Does that mean there's not, is there not truth? Well, I mean, my, I mean when, 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 you know, God is engaged in a holy war. And when God is engaged in a holy war, there's times where the, the, the practices of war take place. So, for example, you think of, uh, well, uh, in, in Joshua, right? The, the spies are, are hid, and there's, there's, there's deception that takes place on Rahab, and she's, and she's blessed for it, right? Uh, she's put in the, into, into the hall of faith because of, because of, 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 of her deception. Uh, and so, and so there, there, there's times when God is fighting for his name uh, that, that, that he uses things to bring judgment. He uses deception to bring judgment on those uh, that are his enemies. And yet, and yet, even in this, he sends this deceiving spirit, and he sends the, the prophet with the truth to tell him, I've sent these deceiving spirits. And so now Ahab is meant to choose, okay, who do I listen to? Do I listen to these 400 prophets who all agree and are saying, I can go in and I'm going to be victorious? Or do I listen to this one random guy that I don't like who's saying, this is what's taking place? Um, now look what happens, verse 24. It says, then Zedekiah, the son of uh, 
the son of Canaan, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, how did the spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? So this guy seriously thinks that he's a, he's a prophet. And, and, and maybe, he, maybe he, he is in a sense, but he's, got a, he's been sent a lying spirit. And Micaiah said, behold, you shall see on the de- that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. And the king of Israel said, seize Micaiah and take him back to uh, Amon, the, go- the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him meager rations of bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. So this is Ahab's third warning. He, he said, look, if you, if you return in peace, I'm a false prophet. In other words, you're going to die. You are not going to return. And yet Ahab goes anyway. He goes into battle and he tells, uh, in, verse, in verse 30, he tells Jehoshaphat that I'm going to disguise myself and go into battle. But you wear your robes and the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. So he, he, he despises the word of the Lord. He, he, he disregards the word of the prophet. Um, and he goes into battle. And, and I, love, I, love what, I love what happens. Uh, uh, the, the Syrians, they think Jehoshaphat's the king of Israel, and so they go and attack him, and then it says that Jehoshaphat cries out, and when he cries out, somehow they recognize, okay, that's not Ahab. And so it says, and when the captains of the chariots, verse 33, saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Verse 34, but a certain man, we have random guy, uh, drew his bow at random, or, or uh, another translation of that is, is in innocence. Like it's just, he just kind of accidentally drew his bow, and struck the king of Israel between the scale armor and the breastplate. So like in, in the perfect spot. So just a random guy. And it says, And the blood of the wound flowed into the bottom of the chariot. And uh, verse 38, and they, uh, it says, And they washed the chariot by the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and the prostitutes washed themselves in it, according to the word of the Lord that he had spoken. Um, or yeah, in, in verse 35 it says that he died. Uh, so, 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 so God's judgment comes upon him, uh, and, and, and he dies. And then you kind of see the, 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 the author's judgment upon Ahab in verse 39. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house that he built and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. That kind of concludes... That concludes Ahab's, Ahab's life. And so, so, so what, what, is the, what is the third sin of Ahab? So the first, do what? Arrogance. Arrogance? How so? Yeah. This will be, so, 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 so here, let's, I'll put these, these, these kind of, these sins in order. Ahab's first sin, he makes peace with a hater of God. Ahab's second sin, he kills a faithful brother. And Ahab's third sin is he rejects the word of the Lord. He's, he's arrogant. He, 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 does, he, does, he, doesn't, he thinks he doesn't need it. He doesn't, he's not going to listen to you. Um, now here's what I think is interesting. This, uh, Ahab's sins is the pattern of sin in the Bible that we see. Um, in fact, uh, well, we, we won't turn there, but let me just, so, so Genesis 3, what do Adam and Eve do? What's their sin? They eat of the apple. They, they reject the word of the Lord, right? The Lord says, don't eat. We're going to reject that, right? What happens in Genesis 4? Murder. Cain kills the faithful brother, right? The one that, that who, who, for whatever reason, his, his offering was, was acceptable for the Lord. Uh, what happens in Genesis 6? Brandon, you really like this, this, this passage. We've talked about it. What happens at the very beginning of Genesis 6? It says that the, the sons of God go into the daughters of men. Now, now regardless of what, what you think, who the sons of God are, it doesn't matter, but there's this unholy union that takes place that shouldn't be taking place. That's exactly what happens in Ahab's life. He rejects the word of the Lord. He has an unholy union, uh, and, and he kills a faithful brother. Uh, and that's the, that's the pattern. In fact, that's the, that's the pattern in Jesus' life. Uh, Jesus' word that he, he, he declares to the people, it's rejected. They don't believe it. His disciples really don't believe it. They don't listen to it. Uh, he's the faithful brother of Israel who's killed, right? And there's an unholy union between Israel and the Romans. They, they, they ally together to kill the faithful servant. Um, and so, so these patterns, this is, this is what you see. Like, like, That's why I, I think Genesis 1 through, through 11 is like arguably the most important 
uh, passage of Scripture for understanding how you interpret the Bible, because everything that happens in Genesis 1 through 11 plays out itself in almost every single story. Everything is somehow, it's, it's just a, a, a rehearsal, again, going through um, a pattern um, that, 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 that should warn us. Like, this is what we see. This is how, this is how we reject the word of the Lord. This is what happens. Um, all right, any, uh, any closing thoughts or questions? How did I do? Uh, seven minutes late. That's all right. I, I got through a good section there. Yeah, you're right. Sure. Sure. Well, and, but here's, here's the thing. At times, we do get that way. At times, we do let our arrogance take over. At times, we, 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 we disregard the, you know, because, because this, you know, ultimately, this is our prophet, right? Uh, now, we have, we have preachers that hopefully represent this, and, 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 and in some ways, you know, when I, on a Sunday morning, I'm, I'm, I'm prophetically speaking in that I'm bringing God's word to God's people. Uh, but, but, but at times, we disregard it. Uh, but what, what, is offered us, and what was offered Ahab was for him to humble himself, repent, confess, which at least he went through the motions one time, but it, either it wasn't real or, or, or whatnot, because he goes off and, and in his arrogance, he disregards the word of the Lord. Uh, but we have, you know, as we're, as we're seeing on, on Sunday morning, we have a, we have a, a Savior who is, who is waiting for us and calling us to respond, and it never, it never turns us away um, when, when, his, when, his, when his true people come in repentance um, and, 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 and hearing the word of the Lord, he, he gives forgiveness over and over and over and over. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's good. We pray we don't, but when we do, uh, we've got a mediator. Uh, we have Jesus, who's our high priest. So yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, that's good. right. It's a battle we all fight, isn't it, Frank? (laughs) All right. Let me close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you always for your word. We thank you. Lord, we thank you for the example of Ahab, um, a a poor example, um, but Lord, uh, an example that that, uh, can cause us to to reflect on our heart. Um, Lord, help us to to, to listen to your word, uh, to live in accordance with and and obediently to, to your word. Lord, help us to not have uh, anger in our hearts towards brothers. Help us to live peaceably. Um, and God, help us to be able to fight sin in our lives, to cut it off, um, to, to strive for, for holiness and righteousness in our lives, and to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Um, so we thank you for these things. We thank you for these truths that are, that are repeated over and over again in the Word um, so that we might hear them and we might be able to respond to them. We thank you for Jesus, our, our high priest, our mediator, Um, who who intercedes for us and offers forgiveness every time we come in true repentance and faith. It's in his name we pray. Amen.